There are a lot of details that come into play when you choose what marinas to stay at during your cruising season. I'll show you how I do it on this video, Cruise Planning, How to Pick the Perfect Marina, here on The Onboard Life. When I'm planning the routes for our cruising season, after we've prioritized our destinations, sometimes selecting a marina is easy. It's either a case of beggars can't be choosers or the attractiveness of a destination drives our choice. If we want to be someplace, we may have to accept what's available, good or bad. But a lot of the time, we have to make choices between multiple marinas. For that, I have a model of the criteria I consider, NDSAAPP. First of all is N for navigability. What's it like to get there? How far off our route is it? How much depth is there to get to it? Are there any hazards such as shoals or rocks we have to navigate past? How much of a pain in the neck is it to even get there? I'm pretty open to varying navigability issues. Our boat has only a three foot draft, so a lot of places are open to us that other boats may have to shy away from. D is for dockage. What's the water's depth at the dock? And what about tide swings and currents? One time we were on a facing dock along with an ocean going sailing boat that came in out of a tropical storm. Its keel dug in the bottom at every low tide. Then there's the details about the docks. Are the docks floating or fixed? What kind of power is available? Is there potable water? Are there pilings or cleats? Is there room for your boat? How wide are the slips? How wide are the thoroughfares or the aisles between the docks? I wanna make sure I can turn our 45 foot long boat around. That's a big deal for us. How long are the finger docks? Do we have to dock stern first? Our boat isn't set up too well to do that. We don't have a stern egress, so we have to dock bow in first. There have been times that we've struggled to get off and on our boat because the finger docks are too short to reach our boat's gangway. And is a marina and us open to being rocked by the water of passing boats? S is for services. Perhaps the most important is pump out. We all have to pump out, but not every marina does it. If they do, do we have to go to a fuel dock? Is it at the slips or is there some kind of local pump out boat? And does it cost anything? And do they really work? Do they have fuel? Is it just a marina or is it also a boatyard? Are local marine technicians available for repairs? The first A is for amenities. Almost all marinas have bathrooms, but not showers or laundry. Is there a lounge? Lounges are nice. Do they have even a modest selection of marine parts and supplies? Is the marina new? There's a code word you need to learn, rustic. When a boater says that a marina is rustic, they're really saying it's old and kind of beat up. What other niceties are available? I like to swim, is there a pool? And perhaps the most important amenity today is Wi-Fi. We depend on it, and a marina not having a decent Wi-Fi signal is pretty much a deal breaker anymore. The second A is for accessibility. Is there a town nearby? If so, how do we get there? Is there public transportation? Do we have to use our bicycles or do we have to hoof it? Some marinas have a loaner car. Some have shuttle buses. Some are on bus routes. Ride sharing services have made things easier, but they're not available everywhere. And what's the most likely reason that a marina's accessibility is important? That's the first P, provisioning. You need to be able to get to a grocery store and get food. The size and fanciness of a marina is not indicative of provisioning opportunities. We've stayed at lots of big, fancy, expensive marinas where there isn't a grocery store or even a convenience store anywhere nearby. But we've stayed at little, rustic marinas with a food lion or Publix across the street. If you need to provision, you need to do research on your destination. And be careful about DDD, Dock Master Distance Dementia. If you ask the folks at a marina how far away a store is, they're going to undershoot the distance to you every time. Now, the last P is very important, price. And that's totally up to you. Are you a vagabond or itinerant boater with a very limited budget and you only come into a marina if you absolutely have to? Your choices are more limited. If you have more money available, you have more choices. That's just how things work. But high price does not always mean it's the best deal and best marina to pull into. We've been very happy at some small, modest, perhaps rustic marinas that are easy on our pocketbook. But we like to splurge sometimes too. Every marina has its good and not so good points. We've stayed at very expensive marinas that were huge disappointments and modest rustic marinas that were delightful. But you have to start someplace. That's what the NDSAAPP model is for. Now what about us? What do we look for in a marina? 
Well, let's tick down the NDS AAPP list. Navigability. Our shallow draft makes this not such a big issue. I can get us through almost any situation. Dockage. I guess we have a preference for floating docks, but fixed are fine. Again, our shallow draft makes the depth at the dock not such a big deal. But the width of the thoroughfares are. Maneuverability once we're in the marina is critical. We also prefer long finger docks. And don't assign us to a slip at the innermost part of the marina. Keep us out. Being able to tie up to a facing dock or T-head is always preferable. Services. Pump out at the slip is almost always a winner for me. Given the choice between two similar marinas, one with pump out at the slips, the other at a fuel dock, I'll always choose the former. Amenities. We're not overly picky, but I do love a swimming pool. Accessibility. This is a big one for us. We'll rent a car if we have to, we do have bicycles we can ride, and we'll take buses. A marina with a shuttle service to grocery stores or a town center is attractive, but to have access to a loaner car is hard to beat. We'll pay a little more for better accessibility. Provisioning. When I make up a season's cruise plan, I always pre-establish where our provisioning stops might be. It's a big deal. There's a wild card for us this year. We have a new refrigerator on board the boat. It's not as big as the old one, and that is going to affect when and where we provision. And last, price. We are, by nature, frugal, but not cheap. We'll pay for quality and for a pleasant memory, but we look at every spending choice we make through a value filter. But for this upcoming season, we know we're heading into expensive territories, especially New York City and Long Island Sound. So be it. There's another resource to consider, and that's the reviews on crowdsourced info hubs such as Active Captain and Waterway Guides. As with all reviews, you have to filter the comments with common sense, but the dominant gist of the reviews is probably valid. But remember, there's always a few cranks that are never happy with anything, and a few others whose vision is always rose-colored. And as it is sometimes said about such things, individual results may vary. I've also gotten good info through posting questions about marinas on Facebook and Twitter. Now, are you curious what some of our favorite marinas are? There's a link to a blog post about our top six favorite marinas in the description. Well, that's it. Cruise planning part two, how to pick the perfect marina. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, ask questions and make comments, and share it with everyone you know. Click the little bell so that you receive notifications whenever I post a new video and connect with me on social media. Also, make sure you check out these videos on the Onboard Life YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. See you next time on the Onboard Life.